This episode of Shadowversity is brought to you by the Sword Shirt, which proclaims the truth that every sword enthusiast knows down to their core that swords are awesome. Why? Because swords! That's why. Available through Teespring. Link in the description. Shadowversity. Greetings, I'm Shad, and the wonderful guys over at Knowledge Hub have recently made a video entitled A Brief History of Swords, and seeing as swords are one of my areas of passionate interest, I feel obliged to make a response video to offer a correction or two. The mistakes that Knowledge Hub have made in their video are nowhere near as bad as some of the misinformation and uninformed statements I have made in my own past videos. I have since corrected them, but if anyone feels inclined to hate on Knowledge Hub because of this, you need to hate on me because I've done far worse. We need to change the perspective of looking at being wrong as a bad thing. It can actually be a wonderful and positive thing. If I do not make my first video on the falchion, which is still up on this channel, of course with disclaimers everywhere, that is a load of bull. I never would have learned the deeper facts about this awesome sword. And if Knowledge Hub didn't make this video, perhaps they never would have been in a position to be able to be corrected by someone who spends far too much time researching this subject than the average person. So for myself, I don't see many circumstances at all where someone should feel censured or feel a lack of freedom to expressing or even teaching something that they currently believe to be factual. One of the ways that you can learn if the information you possess is correct or incorrect is by sharing it, especially when the correct information is possessed by fewer people and the research that you have done to this point is painting a narrative that you can do nothing but accept because you haven't found any other information that contests it. And it's not to say that everything in the video is wrong, just these few things that I'm going to point out. And they are incorrect according to my own current level of understanding. But having had some of these same misconceptions and being presented with different facts and comparing and weighing up the evidence, this is where my current level of understanding sits in regards to these topics. Blades were limited by the strength of the material of which it were constructed. Bronze and copper could not create blades longer than a dagger that could be expected to hold their own in combat. Alright, so there is an important qualifier that Tyler adds to the end of his statement that swords made out of bronze were no bigger than a dagger, being that could be expected to hold their own in combat. Ultimately, this statement is incorrect, but also the uh, structure of this statement as well leads to an additional bit of misinformation that someone might interpret without catching that qualifying statement, and that is people thinking that swords made out of bronze were no bigger than daggers, which of course they were, and it is not what Tyler is saying in the video, but it is what could be employed if they don't catch this qualifying statement. And then he is saying that swords made out of bronze and copper could not create swords that would be expected to hold their own in combat. Anything too long would bend or break on impact. Well, this is completely incorrect, as definitively proven by the archaeological remains of swords made out of bronze that were most definitely bigger than daggers. In fact, classical period swords like this got far larger than many people assume, to the full length of what this sword enthusiast would consider to be the length of an arming sword. Now, if bronze swords of this length could not be expected to hold their own in combat, I pose the question that then, why were they made and used in combat? They would not have been used in combat if they couldn't be expected to hold their own. Of course, they did hold their own. They weren't nearly as strong as steel, but with the right techniques of hammer forging, compressing the bronze into a really tight, sharp edge, a hard edge, you'll be very uh, surprised as what these bronze swords could do. Moving on. Moving closer to the classical era, Greeks found themselves using swords, but they were not the primary weapon of a soldier. They were reserved for if all else failed, and they weren't seen as much more than a long dagger. No swordsmanship was taught or valued, just swing at the enemy. No swordsmanship was taught or valued in Greek times? And I'm assuming it's an assumption based on the fact that anyone who, uh, you know, believes this statement also believes that there is no evidence showing any type of formal swordsmanship in Greek times. Now. I'm not an expert on Greek history, but it didn't take much of a Google search to find some interesting indications of Greek swordsmanship. I found a whole article on footwork in ancient Greek swordsmanship by Brian F. Cook 
keeper of Greek and Roman antiquities of the British Museum, where from studying pictorial evidence from Greek pottery, he finds indications of formalized Greek swordsmanship. This isn't definitive evidence, just just an example that there are certain things to indicate that there was a formalized type of swordsmanship in Greek times. But even regardless of the evidence, there is a precedent, okay, to expect that there was. And it was this very precedent that caused me to doubt the statement in the Knowledge Hub video, which then led me to find the article I've just shown you. You see, in studying history and combat, I've learned that there are some generally reliable rules. One of them being this. When soldiers used a type of weapon, you can bet your money with a pretty high level of assurance that they practiced and trained to use them effectively. It's pure logic. Which soldier or anyone going into combat wouldn't do some measure of drills or practice to learn how to do it? And we know that Greek soldiers use swords. So the thought that they didn't practice or value combat ability with these weapons is just ludicrous. So far in my own study of looking at the historical origins of swords, I found documentation outlining sophisticated martial arts developed in Europe, the Middle East, India, China, Japan, Africa as well. So take this as a general rule. When fighting becomes serious, especially in terms of warfare, large scale battle, given the time, people will always train and practice to do it effectively. Important qualify there, given the time. If they have time, okay. Now to the next one. As the Roman Empire rose, swordsmanship was truly born. So what we previously discussed obviously debunks this statement here, saying that swordsmanship existed before Roman times. No, we can be very confident it existed before then. Gladiators would train their entire lives for sport and spectacle, and would die if not well prepared. They saw techniques used by other cultures, such as thrusting to pierce armor. Here's another general rule of thumb that should be applied to most historical analysis. Armor was effective, and it worked. Otherwise, no one would have worn it. People wore as much armor as was available to them. So the idea that people would try and thrust through armor as one of the first options in trying to combat it is incorrect. No, the first idea of trying to combat armor is try and attack around it in the areas that are not armored. And then if that was too difficult, yes, more specialized weapons were, or weapon design just changed in general to try and combat the weak points in armor. Like very acute tips on sword blades to try and thrust through and burst apart the rings in mail, and very, very sharp blades that were also very thin to try and slash through the many layers of padded armor. Now it's interesting, in the context of the gladiators, very few of them were fully armored. They only wore, say, a helmet or a bit of armor here and there. Oftentimes their chests were completely bare, so the need to try and train to learn how to thrust through armor is a bit redundant. And then just the overall concept of thrusting through armor is very counterproductive and ineffective and was not the first option in real historical combat at all. Why? Because you were never guaranteed to actually get through that armor. Armor was effective and it worked. So instead of gambling to burst through the armor, it was much better to go for the areas that didn't have it. As the Middle Ages approached, tampering and quenching of iron made metal stronger. This point is nitpicky, I, I freely admit, and it's merely the distinction between iron and steel, but I'm just stating it because it's an opportunity to tell and educate people just of, you know, the interest, the actual way things were done. Facts, right? Quenching iron has no effect, okay? Uh, quenching steel is very important. But you see the difference between iron and steel. Iron is a pure element. It's on the periodic table, where steel is an alloy of this element, meaning you add another element in creating something new. And you've added carbon to the iron to create steel. And by doing that, this has a very important effect uh, when you heat it up and cool it down. Iron, no, the composition or distribution of the different elements doesn't matter because it's only a single element. There can't be any effect. But steel, yes. When steel is heated up, the actual iron molecules kind of, uh, using layman terms, probably inaccurate, but just to try and convey the visual imagery, they kind of expand, meaning that there's more room in between the iron atoms than when they were cooled down. And this creates more room for the carbon atoms to fit in between them. This is important in regards to the cell structures they can form. Steel that is cooled down slowly, because the iron molecules don't want the steel in between them, the larger amount
amount of iron molecules ends up pushing out the carbon atoms into a higher density of a lesser proportion of the iron molecules, which creates a crystalline form called perlite. If there's enough carbon in it, if there's not enough carbon, perlite can't really form properly. This is a mild steel on the stronger end, but if you cool it down quickly, and this is where quenching becomes really important, the iron molecules don't have enough time to push out the carbon to the level that they would have normally, trapping the carbon in a more even distribution throughout the material. This creates the martensite crystalline structure, which is hardened steel. This is the steel used for tool steel, spring steel, amazing stuff. So I'm just explaining this to show and demonstrate why quenching and tempering is so important, but it can only be done with steel. Iron, no effect at all. The code of chivalry maintained that one wouldn't draw their weapon unprovoked. Okay, so this statement is perpetuating an incorrect idea of chivalry, and that is that chivalry was a unified, understood code amongst medieval Europe that everyone agreed to. This is the incorrect notion which is perpetuated so often. The truth is, chivalry was a changing and evolving subjective ideology imposed upon knights for the intent to encourage or discourage certain behaviour. And depending on what the individual wanted out of their knights or their very own knighthood, if they are a knight themselves, chivalry would be different. Still, with all these differences, you can name a couple, but only a couple, of ideals that were consistent among all all the forms of chivalry, such as bravery and loyalty. But when we get to things like nobility, fair play, uh, and the list can go on, on and on, they became very, very subjective, especially the assertion made in Knowledge Hub's video that chivalry maintained that one would not draw their sword unprovoked. I'm not saying that there wasn't interpretations of chivalry that had this practice a part of it. I'm saying that stating this practice as a universal part of chivalry is absolutely incorrect. Chivalry was subjective, so much so to the point that there were legitimate versions of chivalry as defined in history that encourages practices that outwardly contradicted one another. I've made a whole video on this subject that I go into much more detail entitled The Truth About Chivalry and the Knight, and this is a good example because even in this video I actually do state a factually incorrect thing that I have then corrected in a later video and also put a notation. And it's when I explain the development of the stirrup facilitated the rise of the knight. That is completely incorrect, so disregard that statement in the video, but please do listen to everything else. Guns need ammo though, and reloading. Close combat was not gone, and the importance of the sword re-emerged. What also helped wasn't advancement in warfare though, it was printing. As the printing press allowed information to be easily spread to a large audience, the art of sword fighting became less exclusive. Techniques that were once only taught by a master to a few subjects were now available to all. Complete with illustrations describing how to perform advanced moves, the appeal of the sword grew once more. Okay, there's a lot to unpack with this one. Uh, first of all, the uh, kind of assumptions being made that sword had fallen out of popularity with the advent of basic firearms. Clearly the pistol did eventually replace the sword as the standard sidearm for self-defense, but the implication in the video proposes that guns arose, making swords less popular, but then people realized that they needed to be reloaded, which brought in melee combat once again to the forefront, which made them popular again. When in reality it would have been guns came around, but people saw the limitations in them inherently right away, and knew that a sword would still be useful, so they never really went out of popularity at all. Their functional validity remained consistent during the early advent of firearms. The next statement I can only assume to be another assumption because I have no idea where Tyler and the guys of Knowledge Hub would have gotten this idea that the popularity or use of the sword was waning until the advent of the printing press and of course the treatises outlining certain sword use. I think is making a logical bridge in that with the printing press and books becoming more available to the common person, therefore the common person was more able to learn about sword fighting. My own study of history disagrees with this, and I have found that the average person was actually practicing swordsmanship far before the printing press ever came around. Also, the statements regarding the printing press making available more advanced swordsmanship made the art of sword fighting less exclusive. The thing is, the art of sword fighting was rarely exclusive to the upper class. Now, certain types of swords were preferred over other uh, types of swords between classes. The nobility and wealthy people tended to prefer the longsword in the period where the longsword was prominent, and the one-handed arming sword combined with the buckler was very popular amongst the average person. 
but sword and buckler is still a type of swordsmanship. Also during the late medieval period of what we would now call Germany, it was a legal requirement for the citizenry to own swords. So far from being exclusive to the upper class, the average citizen was required to own one and carry it depending on the city in which you lived. There are one or two cases where it was more illegal to carry swords out in open public, but that was only in those cities and they were more the exception than the norm. Thrusting swords include the rapier, which have a straight blade and protective hilt. They were light and exclusively designed for the purpose of jabbing at the enemy. I've also made a whole video on this topic, and you can guess by the thumbnail what I'm going to be addressing with this statement. Rapiers were not light. Not at all. Now the small swords that Tyler shows in the video, well they're light because they're small swords, they're not rapiers. The standard rapier weighed the absolute same amount as the standard arming sword, 1.2 kilos. The difference being the weight distribution. The width or girth of the blade was actually made thinner to extend the length of it and also put more steel on the guard, the swept guard around the hilt, which equates to a rapier weighing the same amount as an arming sword. And in particular, the type of stances you have to maintain in proper rapier fighting, the actual historical way they fought with rapiers, requires far more endurance and stamina than other styles, to the point that fighting with a rapier is more difficult and requires more strength than fighting with a medieval arming sword. On the other side, swords designed for cutting were the saber. But have a look at the saber right in the middle of the very picture in their own video. That is not a saber designed for cutting, that is a thrusting focused saber. Another example is the model 1913 cavalry saber. Simply put, sabers came in many varieties. Ones designed to primarily focus on thrusting and ones designed primarily focused for cutting. Okay, so this has been my reply video to Knowledge Hub's A Brief History of Swords. Regardless of the mistakes in this video, Knowledge Hub is still an excellent YouTube channel. And I mean that when I say it is proven by the fact that I've been a subscriber to their channel for quite a while. History is a very complex subject, rife with many misconceptions, and for any enthusiast that endeavours to try and learn about things, they are invariably going to learn several incorrect notions throughout their study. It's impossible to avoid because there's so many out there. I have fallen prey to them, everyone does. And when we do, let us hope that there are more informed people on the given subject who are willing to share their evidence with us, as James Elmsley did for me in my Falchion video, as I am doing for Knowledge Hub for their Swords video, and as I am sure Knowledge Hub may very well do for me in one of the videos I make in the future where I say something incorrect. And I thank them ahead of time for it, because we are all trying to learn as much correct information about the past as we can. Why? Because it's awesome! Thank you for watching guys, I hope you've enjoyed, and please do go check out Knowledge Hub. Like I said, great YouTube channel, definitely worth subscribing. I am a subscriber, and I look forward to watching their content into the future. I hope to see you again, and until that time, farewell.